good morning students so welcome back to your online class and in the last class we have taken up a new lesson called the moguls and the maratha rulers okay so we have studied about uh, barbar umayyad akbar and jahangir and i have told you that in today's class we are going to study about shah jahan right so today we are going to study in detail about shah jahan Shah Jahan during the regime of Shah Jahan the Mughal invasions on South India continued the Nubil Khan Jahan Lodi of Afghanistan rebelled uh, rebelled against him and got defeated and he is also defeated a portuguese in 1632 ce and annexed ogli for them and he took amadnagar under his control his relationship got spoiled with the sheikhs and bandilas he faced defeated uh defeated by uh, uzid burks while trying conquering the bulk region of in the middle asia shah jahan followed a method of evaluating the land based on its fertility like how you know even sher uh, sher uh, khan was used to do you know based on the fertility of the land used to uh, give the land taxes right so in the same way even shah jahan continued in the same way by seeing the fertility he used to share the taxes land taxes based on it taj mahal red fort at delhi and other other architecture during his reign and is called the golden period in the end and the interval rivalries among his sons succeeded him aurangzeb uh, finally came as become his successor what was the period run by the shah jahan was called as it was called as the golden period understood so there was the internal rivalry which was happening uh, between shah i mean shah jahan son zoli so finally who became the successor of shah jahan is none other than aurangzeb okay so in, we are going to study in detail about this aurangzeb he was a son of shah jahan Aurangzeb imprisoned his father and ascended the throne with the title called Alamgir. So, what kind of a cruel child is he? This Aurangzeb he just imprisoned Shah Jahan. That means he imprisoned Shah Jahan and he became a successor. And that is the reason he is called as Alamgir. Understood. So, he temporarily quelled the rebellions of Oms in the east and Ans uh, Yusuf fates in the northwest. and his decision to imprison his dishonor the shiva shivraj resulted in the future attacks on the moguls and he had to face the revolts of rajput of mewar ratots and other people who just came and waged the war and, and uh, for the aurangzeb was mewar ratot singh jats bandales and satanamis in north he waged a war against adil shah of bijapur and nizam shah of golconda and annexed them to them uh, into a kingdom finally this enmity with the powerful rajput led to downfall of moguls what happened so he just waged a war against rajput rulers so he could not you know sustain for a many a times that is how he just lost his kingdom and you know made an end to moguls understood so what were the contributions of moguls we'll see sorry before that aurangzeb attempted that there is some uh, which says about aurangzeb was aurangzeb attempted to implement the philosophies advocated in quran society uh, quran strictly the many popular hindu temples were spoiled during his vision he had prohibited sati system what did he do he just prohibited sati system something good about aurangzeb is prohibited sati system okay and they just encourage the musical performances uh, processions grambling consumption of liquor ganja plant extract in his kingdom he lived in a simple life and he is called zinda fakir he just led a very simple life hence his name called as zinda fakir understood which means a living girl. a living of fakir what it means living of fakir got it 
So next we are going to study about the contributions of the Mughals. Administration. The Mughal who ruled India for more than a 200 years have given an important contribution to different areas. How many years this Mughals have ruled? Almost 200 years the Mughals have ruled. Okay. So Mughal rule was was uh, hereditary. Hereditary means obviously father son father son like this. It was hereditary. The power was centralized in a rural ruler, and he was an absolute ruler. Uh, they considered themselves as an emperor and called themselves as bachshahs. What they used to do, no? They considered themselves as a ruler, so they used to call them as bachsha. The bachsha was the absolute head of head uh, of administration, military, judiciary. And he aids the minister to assist him. He had absolute powers to appoint or remove the minister. What this Bachas used to do? If they used to remove the minister or appoint the minister. All this, uh, you know, complete authority was under them. The appointing the mansabdas, the providing the land grants and the formation of laws were the major functions of the king. The Persian was official language. The kingdom was divided into pranta, sarkar, paranganas. Okay, even the you know, kingdoms were divided like this. The Vakil, that is Devan, Mir Bakshi and Mukya Sardar were the important minister of the central government. Who were the important minister of central government? Was Vakil, Devan, Mir Baksha and Mukya Sardar. These are the four, uh, what they, uh, the four, four positions were very important under central government. And they were assisted by the officers like Rajpala, Bakshi, Vakia, Nawaz, Kotwal, Fauzdar, Amal Gunjar, and Batakichi. Uh, okay. And they were having a revenue system like majority of the people were farmers in the Mughal rule. Obviously, farmers means they used to depend upon the land. That is how, based on the fertility of the land only, right? They used to collect the taxes. The land tax was picked the fertility on the land. The agricultural land were measured in order to fix the tax of one third of the product was paid as a, ta a tax either to form of money or a crop. So one third of the crops, whatever they grow, no, they used to collect as a, in the tax form, either they can share the crop also, or they can give the money also. The terminologies used by the Mughals in the revenue system are used even today. That means the terminologies, what they will, they used to uh, use in the land system, no, even today, that uh, particular wordings are in usage. And what kind of the society they were into? In this society, the kings of minister, officers and employees had a better status. Societally, they had a very good status. The people were wearing a jewelry made of pearls. What kind of jewelry they used to wear? The word pearls jewelry, sapphires and other metals. Excluding Aurangzeb and other rulers, engaged in music, dance, consumption of liquor, gambling and other means of entertainment. But what did Aurangzeb do? He just prohibited all these things because he is called Zinda of Fakir, right? He was a very common man. It was just living simple. So he just prohibited all these things. What and all he just prohibited music, dance, consumption of liquor, gambling, all these things are Aurangzeb prohibited. But rest of other kings of Mughal rule, they enjoyed. They entertained. They got good entertainment from that. Farmer life was misery due to the heavy land tax and inefficient of policies and the rules interfaces in the middlemen. The leader, processor, potter, cobbler, washerman, other formed the non-agricultural work of class. Sati system, child marriage, and bride uh, price were in practice. What were there in practice? Sati system, child marriages, and bride price were in practice. Got it? Next comes your economic system. Economic system is what? Money. How was the good money was running out here and there? Since North India had a many rivers, cultivable land was available naturally. A good system of irrigation added a growth in growth of agriculture. There were many government factories. Out of them, the textile industries were concentrated in Banaras, Patna, Dharka, Shasidpura, Sonar, Lohar, Fatehpur, Sikri, and Agra. Akbar supported the travel of carpet weaving works. During the regime of Mughals, apart from internal trade, the trade relationship with other countries of Asia and Europe was economic. He just encouraged all handwork items, and the trade was happening the other countries with Asia and Europe. So obviously the trade is happening with other countries. So the economy will be in the good condition only. Okay. The raw silk metals, horses, perfume, gold and silver were imported. 
What were the things were got imported? It's raw silk, metals, horses, perfume, gold, silver. Those seven items were just imported into the other countries like Europe and Asia. The cotton cloth, paper, opium, and woolen cloths were exported. You know, these things we are just doing the exported. And what was the literature? Next comes your literature. During the Mughal period, the many books were written in Persian, Arabic, Turkish, Hindi, and Sanskrit languages, which are four languages were in practice in the Mughal period. It's Persian, Turkish, Arabic, and Hindi, and Sanskrit. Five languages. Okay. The Barber and Jahangir were the scholars. Who were the scholars? The Barber and the Jahangir were the scholars and they wrote a book of their uh, autobiography is called Barber, Nama and Turkish Jahangiri. You know, the autobiography, the two autobiography under Mughal rule was autobiography. Okay. Was the first one is Babar Nama. Babar Nama, and this is by Barber. Okay, and next comes Turkish Jangiri. This is by Jahangir. Tushkiki Jahangir. And this is by Jahangir. Got it? These are the two autobiographies which was written in a period of Mughal period and it's in Persian language. Baudani translated the Ramayana, uh, translated Ramayana, the first the mathematical work of Leelavati and Raja Todarmala uh, Tod and Bhagavad Purana into a Persian language. The great works were written. Ramacharita Manasa by Tulsi Das, Sur Sagar by Surdas. It's very important. You know, the great works like written by Ramacharita Dasa by Tulsi Dasa and Sur Sagar by Surdas. And what are the art and architecture? The Akbar and Shah Jahan contributed more into our art and architecture during the Mughal period. The buildings were built them in Fatehpur Sikri, Agra and Delhi. During the Akbar's period, Indo-Persian style of architecture came into existence. The famous palaces like Akbari Mahal, Jangiri Mahal, Panch Mahal, Jodabai Mahal, Birba Mahal, Ibad Khana, Jami Masidi, Bulandar Vasa of Fatehpur Sikri was his important contribution. These are the many mosques and good, good buildings what they have built in this architecture of Mughal's period. During the region of Shah Jahan, the red fort of Moti Masivi, Divan Hiham, Divan Hikas, Rangamala of uh, Kasmahal, Taj Mahal, and other buildings were built. So, the throne of Mayura, it is seven years of work of one crore expenses. The throne of Mayura, the spacious of Jami Masidi, where is contribution. Apart from these contributions, Shah Jahan were available in the palaces like Lahore, Kabul, Kar. Kandahar, Kashmir, Ajmer, and Allahabad. So, you know, this, uh, you know, Shah Jahan's contribution is very wide in this architecture of Mughals. Next comes your paintings, the beautiful paintings. During the period of Umayyad, the Mughal heart painting evolved with the help of Mir Syed Hali and Abbas Samad of Persia. The various painted canvases were created. Of that, 17 artists were in the court of Barber and 13 artists were Hindu. So, how many artists were we were having in Mughal period? 17 artists were in the court itself. Otherly, we had 13 were Hindu artisans understood in the court of Mughal period. The famous among them are Daswan Baswan, uh, Daswan Baswan, Lala Jagannath, Mukunda, in Jangir's court, Ustad Mansur. And Abdul Asan were present. The, but Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb were not interested much in paintings. Like this, Mughals contributed into different fields of their rich and Like this, you know, the Mughal rules, rules, uh, ruler, they just ruled for 200 years and they have given a you know, very vast contribution in terms of society, economic, literature, art and, art and architecture, paintings, music, dance, everything. Okay.
so like this the moguls started up their kingdom through barbar and ended up through aurangzeb so let us see the next extended part of moguls as marathas okay yeah can i so next we are going to talk about maratha the extended rule of moguls who you know was marathas so today we are going to talk about marathas okay so the extended rule of moguls after aurangzeb was marathas the rise of maratha kingdom in deccan during 17th century was an important development in which century the maratha rule was started it was started in 17th century Okay. It spread over the present North India during seventeenth century. Maratha was under the control of Nizam Shahi of Ahmednagar and Adil Shahi of Vijayapur. So Maratha was under the control of Nizam Shahi and Adam Adil Shahi of Vijayapur. And these sultans were employed locally. The Marathas of their armies, among them Shahji sultans, employed the local. Okay, Shahji Bonsley was administration under Vijayapur, and he had been a gifted lance. Desh Pandals and Desh Mukhs were the powerful local leaders. Like this, Shivaji Monsli, he was a just uh, you know who was administrator under Vijayapur Sultan, and he has a gifted lance with the Desh Pandals and Desh Mukhs with the powerful local leaders. And we are going to study in detail about Shivaji. You know Shivaji, right? The ruler of Marathas. You know, he treat has a own god for their what for their uh, community. Okay, Marathians, right? The founding of Maratha Kingdom was opened a new chapter in the history of India. The decline of Mughal Kingdom started during the reign of Aurangzeb. You know the decline. As I told you, the last ruler of Mughal was Aurangzeb. After Aurangzeb, Maratha rule started extending. The efficient administration built by the early Mughal rulers was becoming weak. the region regions away from the capital city were experienced the weak administration and the officials were not implemented the orders of emperor the misrule of officials was in marathwad which was away from the capital of western edge of the empire the farmer traded craftsmen were exploited with a huge taxes the social life was burdened with the misbehavior of officials it was impossible way to conduct any social or religious rituals in the public and they were expected to pay the taxes of all this In this chaotic circumstances, Shivaji was able to establish the Maratha kingdom by motivating the religious and cultural fervor among the Marathas. You know what kind of a situation it was, no? You know, for each and everything where they were supposed to pay a tax, it was very tight in the you know society. What after the Aurangzeb's uh, decline of this Maratha uh, Mughal rule, between you know the emergence of Maratha ruler, the time which was all the circumstances make this. you know the people of uh, people were in the society were in the very rigid condition they just wanted to come out of this situation in this circumstances shivaji you know unable to take a chance of you know holding a handle of religious and cultural favor of marathas shivaji is a great king among marathas and he was a successful in providing the efficient administration along with the expansion of his kingdom Influenced by the preaching among the saints and Maharashtra, the Shivaji had the twin aims. What were the two aims he was having? The twin aims is nothing but two aims. That is protection of Hindu religion and establishmenting of what is the first aim he was having? Protection of Hindu Hinduism. And another rule he was having of establishing. establishing maratha kingdom this was the twin aim what shivaji was having 
Shivaji was born in the Shivanari of Pune district. Where did he born? He just born in the place called Shivneri in Pune district. Okay, his father was Shahaji Bonsley. Who was the father? Shahaji Bonsley. Bonsley. Okay, and he was a service of the Vijaypur Sultan. His mother was Jijabai. The mother was Jijabai. Mother was Rejabai, was a pious woman who inculcated the religious fever, uprightness, the honesty and sincerity in her son. Because of her mother only just got that, you know, religious uh, fire in his blood. And so in that way, the mother Rejabai raised up a Shivaji. Dadaji Kondadeva was a Shivaji's guru and he trained in his arm of welfare. Who was the guru of Shivaji? Next comes Guru. What is his name? Dada Ji Kondadeva. Dada Ji Kondadeva. Okay. Was Shivaji's guru and he trained him in the harm fair and the scriptures. Shivaji achieved the proficiency in the bodybuilding, fencing, horse riding, and other field events. In his childhood itself, the Shivaji has dreamt about establishing an independent kingdom. You know, therefore, he made a Pune as a center and started the process of the expansion in his kingdom. In order to achieve uh, this, Shivaji assembled an army of local Mavali youths and trained them in guerrilla welfare. The Shivaji conquered Torna Fort of Purandar Ghat Fort, Chakan uh, Fort, Simmagada, and Jawali Fort of Vijaypura Sultan. He renamed as Vasudurga near Torna Fort of as Raigur and he built a new fort called Pratabghar. Since Shivaji fought against the Vijayapur Sultans and his father, Shaji was captured by the Sultan. On the assurance that he would attack them again, the Shaji was released. You know, that is what Shivaji's regime was. Shivaji, in the small age itself, he dreamt about establishing an independent army. And that is how, because of his all, he, he just encouraged the youths to join into a welfare and train in gor gorilla warfare. And he just started encroaching all other places and due to that you know he emerged as a strong emperor the relationship between the moguls and shivaji how was it shivaji fought against the mogul king called aurangzeb for many years in addition to defeating the shaji kingdoms in south india the aurangzeb has determined the vanish of maratha kingdom completely to achieve this he appointed shah uh, shah Khan of jai singh jai singh defeated shivaji and made agreement of purandargad as per the argument, Shivaji surrendered 23 of his forts and the land a yielding of 16 lakhs income annually. He promised to be loyal to the Mughals and sent 5,000 cavalry and leadership of his son, Sambhaji, to the Delhi with an intention to stop Shivaji becoming the intimate with Adil Shah of Vijaypur and Kutab Shai of Golconda. The Jai Singh called Shivaji to Agra. The Aurangzeb did not show the proper respect to Shivaji in his court and insulted him. Before, you know, before starting this Maratha, you know, Aurangzeb was having a good connection with this Shivaji and he just, you know, he just surrendered all his 16 ports, 5,000 calories and used to, he gave 16 lakhs, uh, uh, the, uh, the annual income which was yielding by the, uh, the small piece of a land, everything he just gave. And, but in spite of that, when Shivaji visited this Aurangzeb kingdom, no, he just insulted them, insulted Shivaji. So when Shivaji protested against this, Shivaji and his son, Sambhaji were in kept in prison in Agra. He just when he, when he protested, so Shivaji, Mata Shivaji Maga, who is he? He is he Sambhaji were kept in prison of Agra. But after a few days, Shivaji along with son escaped from the prison by hiding, the fr hiding in a food, fruit basket and reached dry good. What did he do? Shivaji and his son, he wanted to escape from the prison, right? Fruit basket, he just escaped it. He just got hide into a fruit basket. That is how he escaped to Raigad. Later, he strengthened his army and conquered many fruit and he had lost. 
That means he just started conquering all the fort, 14 forts what he had lost to Aurangzeb. The Shivaji was collecting the Chauta, that is one fourth of the land tax of the regions of Shaji and the Mughal areas. And it was collecting the Sardesh Mok of taxes of one, one tenth of the fixed land taxes. What did he do? Before it was, they were collecting one tenth of the land tax. He started to collect only one fourth of the land tax in his kingdom. Shivaji coronation took place in the year of 1674 CE, a tribe, and he was given a title called Chakra, uh, Chatrapati and Facilitated. What was his name? Uh, what was the uh, Facilitated he got? Chatrapati. Chatrapati. Got it? So, next see how was the administration he was. Shivaji had organized an efficient administration system in the vast kingdom. He had divided a kingdom into a many provinces. Obviously, the kingdom was wide enough, he just divided into provinces. And they were called as Swaraj and Mughal areas. What were they called as? Swaraj and Mughal areas. The Marathas was the language of the administration and they were the ministers known as the Pradhanas in the government to assist the king. You know, the ministers were called as Ashtra Pradhana. Pradhana. He just, the administration of Bantandre. Okay. He was called, ministers were called as Ashtra Pradhanas. Ashta Pradhans in his government to assist the king. In addition to them, there were other officials of the provinces, the district and the village, where the administration units too. Got it? Next, we have got revenue system. What was the revenue? As I told you, one fourth of the land tax was collected. Previously, it was one tenth. Understood? So the Shivaja system of the revenue col uh, collection was Roitwari system. What, what system did he follow? Roitwari system, the favorable to farmers. He abolished the Jangles revenue system. The tax was collected in the form of money or a materials. That means either money they can give or a crop they can give, right? So he just abolished that. He has given the Chauta, that is one fourth of the land taxes and the Sardesh Mukh of one tenth of the land taxes. The Sardesh Mukhs and all the big authorities people, they were supposed to pay one tenth and the farmers used to pay only Chauta, that is one fourth of the type of land taxation were in practice. Next comes judiciary. Judiciary means how, you know, what were the kind of, uh, you know, judiciary is nothing but giving a fair uh, verdicts to the peoples of the society. In Shivaji's administration, the judicial system of the justice were in practice. The village panchayat used to dispense the justice in the villages. We used to handle the justice, the village panchayat people. The Brahmin just, judge used to give the decision based on the smritis. You know, the Brahmins were as a judges and they used to see the Smritis and that is what the punishments they used to give. And when it comes to the army, what kind of a tough army they were having like, the Maratha army had an infantry, what they were having, infantry, cavalry, elephant units and the cannon units. And they were import, important fort in Raigat, Rajgut, Torangat, Pratapgat and Sinmagat. And the Alvudar, that is Alvudar means constables and the supervisor of the fort. The army was divided into small units and the Shivaji soldiers were specifically trained in the guerrilla warfare. What was the warfare? They used to take a training for the army that was called as guerrilla warfare. It's important. And next, successor of Shivaji. Okay. The successor of Shivaji. Let us see in our next class, students. Why? Because all together, if I made you to understand also, you don't get into a point. So, successor of Shivaji and the Peshwas, let us explain in our next class. Okay. So, by this, uh, we have uh, today, in, a, in today's class, we have completed about the Mughals and we have started with Marathas and we have learned about Marathas and how was the administration, how was the economic, religious and judiciary and revenue, everything we have learned. And uh, in the next class, we'll see about the successor of Shivaji. That means the successor of Marathas. Okay. So let us see in our next class all these topics, students. Have a great day. Thank you for the session.